uh, students of the Chief District Instructional Performance Committee meeting. I called to order uh, this meeting. Um, I have present um, via um, virtual um, committee member Bolton and myself, so we have enough form before we start. First item on the agenda is uh, college credit scores. Yes, ma'am. We're so happy to have on the college team Daniel Reed Kulak. She's here and will give us some updates about College Credit Plus. Um, is there, I know the presentation was uploaded ahead of time. Is that something that's visible or? So you did our presentation? Mm-hmm. I sent it to Phyllis Davis. One second, I'll pull it down. Um, so I wanted to give everyone a snapshot of sort of CCP by the numbers for this academic year. We have had um, 33 embedded courses that are offered in our buildings, so our 7 through 12 buildings just across the district. Those embedded courses are ones that are taught by CPS teachers, but they're deputized by our community colleges. We have three partners in this space. University of Cincinnati, Cincinnati State, and Sinclair Community College that are sponsoring our courses. There are 525 unique students participating in the program this academic year. And we have a 30 or an 83% fall success rate. I will say that that, that number is pulled um, from our schools that don't include Walnut Hills. So Walnut Hills tends to skew our data. And they actually have a 96.4% success rate with credit acquisition in this space, but the rest of our schools are hovering around 83%. And when I say 83%, it means they actually achieved the credit. Um, the other 17% is either a, an F or a withdrawal grade for those courses. So I also wanted to give a breakdown of where we have trends, like what are our trends within College Credit Plus by building. So you'll notice that in general, we're seeing growth across the district. So from 1920 to 2021, we have growth in pretty much all of our buildings. And then what we project for 21-22 is based on letters of intent. So our students are required by the state to fill out what's called a letter of intent, which means they plan to participate in dual enrollment or college credit plus programs next year. So that's where those projected numbers are coming from. We don't know that all of those students will participate. It's just that they have given their consent and a parent's consent in order to, to pursue that option for next academic year. All of the asterisks that are noted are buildings where we do offer these classes. So Aiken actually started offering classes for the first time um, in 2021. And so you'll see that they moved from zero participants the prior year to 22 this year. They're also adding additional sections. So they'll be adding history, um, an additional mathematics course um, uh, for the next academic year. So you can kind of see, again, trends for growth. And then if you continue to the next slide, that features our other buildings. You'll also notice Walnut Hills numbers for letters of intent next year are really high. I will notice um, a lot of students fill out that letter of intent with Walnut, but don't necessarily participate. So again, there's, there's this a little bit flex of the data based on sort of building culture. Um, one thing that we really wanted to focus on this year are our gaps in participation. So we did a deeper data dive into who is actually participating and benefiting from College Credit Plus programming across the district and who is not benefiting from this program. So there are some pretty large race and ethnicity gaps in participation. Our district numbers, um, if you look comprehensively, and again, we could dig deeper into what this means for grades 7 through 12, or if we're just looking at 11 through 12, what are our demographics, but this is entire across the district, the numbers that I pulled. 
Um, we're hovering around 61.4% of our students are identified as Black or African American, but only about 43 to 45% of our students to participate in this program fit in that identity group. And then I also did the same breakdown for our white students. So again, our white students are overrepresented for benefiting from this program. Our Black and African American students are underrepresented. We have the same gaps or sort of gaps with gender. So if you look at our district demographics versus our CP demographics, by and large, our female students are benefiting from these programs more than our male students. And then finally, the last measure we wanted to look at was economically disadvantaged. So as a district, we roughly have 78.4%. But if we look at that identifier for our CCP population, it's at 44.5. So as we look at success in this space, or, or where we hope to grow, or the things that we hope to address, these are the identity groups that we're really trying to focus on um, gap closing. So how do we provide opportunities? How do we close opportunity gaps? How do we get these populations of students to have the same benefits as our other subgroups of students? Um, these are just quotes from research. I'm also, I'm happy to, to, I think everybody has these slides that are that are sent to them, but if you want more data on this research, it's just pulling out some key things about dual enrollment programs and why growth in this space might be particularly relevant or important to CPS. In general, um, male students, low income students, and students with lower grade point average have higher benefits, like long term benefits, with matriculation to college, degree attainment, um, even high school achievement. We're seeing increases in these populations at a greater rate than other subgroups who participate in these programs. So there's some long term benefits to students that are engaged in dual enrollment and CCP programming. Um, also, they just came out with a study out of Colorado, which was an entire state study, where um, if they compared students of similar identity groups, similar uh, backgrounds, the students that participated in dual enrollment program were more likely to obtain um, a college degree. They were more likely to enter college within one year of graduation. Um, and we're more likely to have higher earnings five years out than students that did not participate in dual enrollment. So those are the types of research things we're basing our growth on. And then drilling down to our population at CPS, we looked at what are the strategies to expose students to these opportunities? How do we close those gaps? So we looked at if, um, our male students, our black male students in particular, and we saw that when, when CCP programming is taking place on a college campus, we have a much lower rate of participation than if it's offered in their high school building. So we only had nine unique male students in the year uh, 1920 participate when it was on a college campus, but we had 40 that participated when it was in their high school building. Um, same trends for our economically disadvantaged students. So only 37 participated when it was on a college campus, but 170 participated when it was in their high school building. Um, so that kind of brings us to our strategy and what we've been working toward. So for next academic year, we have 13 new embedded courses that will be offered. Gamble will be offering um, CCP courses for the first time this next academic year. We also have teachers that are interested in um, earning the credential, and we've been supporting those teachers in earning the credential by academic year 22-23. So we hope to see Euler and Riverview offer some of these classes, which they've never done before, um, by 22-23. This is just numbers-wise. We did see a 13% increase in unique participants from 1920 to 2021. And right now, with the teachers that we've recruited to get credentialing, we expect to offer 57 embedded courses by 2020. Um, and then just celebrations and accomplishments. So we have some students who've earned associate's degrees um, and certificates. So again, these are just to celebrate these. As in a June end of year report, I'll also be reporting on credit hours earned, tuition dollars saved, and overall success from fall, summer, and spring. Um, and I would like to break that down by building um, as well as comprehensive, again, so that we don't have any one building sort of shifting the numbers in that space. That's all I've got. Do any members have questions, comments? 
Bolton. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I, of course, we're all concerned about the gaps. And of course, you all in the college kind of office can't actually deal with the gaps. That gap starts way earlier than high school. And I'm going to say it again. We have to do something about grades four, five, and six. Uh, and about, I think, the over-identification of many of our students as needing um, remediation and developmental efforts. We are not finding ways to actually measure or um, evaluate the, the, the intelligence of our students. Uh, and I'm worried about that. So uh, that's my concern. It's good, it's great. And I think that associate degree piece, boy, was something that should be expanded. That would be it. You could be offering and we could figure out ways to, to expand that. That would be great. But my big concern is the over identification uh, of our students that uh, regarding needing some sort of additional remediation and development. We have not left our previous culture of being a district of remediation instead of a, a district of academic uh, uh, achievement. So I, I hope that the administration in this new CPS can find a way to address four, five, and six and the over identification and keep working towards that associate degree piece. I think that's wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Bowles. Good. Thank you. Uh, for me, um, I am impressed uh, about how we're expanding, and uh, hopefully these levels of intense will be actual students that are taking the courses. Um, and I'm glad to see that we're offering them on site. Um, but I know transportation historically has been an issue and people being consistent with growing up, but we were able to roll that back. Thank you very much. Um, one of the other uh, questions I have is you made a point about um, the district ethnicity um, overall versus compared to your high school or even your 7th, 7th, 8th. But 7th, 8th doesn't take CC, I was correct, course pro, pro, uh, programs, do they? 7th and 8th grade? They're eligible. Oh, are they? Do we have like, any that take the course in 7th and 8th? We have a few. Okay. Um, a very, very small number, but we, yes, we have a few. But you did make the point of breaking it down to actual um, maybe high school um, versus district, and this thing I think that would be ideal for me versus the whole district and how many are taking the courses. And I have a question about the range. When I see a range of 43 to 45, why is it my exact number in this range? Um, I pulled two years worth of data. Okay. So um, the 1920 data looks a little different than the, the 2021 data. Okay. All right. And then the other inquiry that I have. Um, is that um, I heard committee member Bolton mention um, that this has to start with intermediate and, and we've been talking about and I believe that you know that that is a new CPS as where that is kind of like the goal to roll this back because taking the course is one thing and being prepared for the course and feeling comfortable to take advanced courses just like AP doesn't look the same <laughs> so taking it is one thing passing AP courses and then being comfortable with taking CCP courses looks different so being at that point where they're up comfortable enough, especially with our, our African American students, um, feeling okay in that in that area, I think with the confidence and if we wrote the uh, river back earlier, as um committee uh, member Bowman has expressed, and I hope that we are moving that way, that uh, um, to me will increase some of some of the uh, close some of those gaps. So um I think that was it. That's a lot of those. That was it. Thank you. All right. Um Actually, All right, so I'm pleased to uh, report to the uh, committee uh, today on um, some of the district-wide, district-wide uh, extracurricular activities we were able to 
um, keep in place and even grow a little during this challenging time. Uh, so the first program that I'd like to highlight is the CPS Jazz Academy. Uh, we expanded to a total of 65 students this year, 50% growth over 2019 and 20. We did it in three different learning environments. We did it fully remote when we needed to be fully remote. We did it blended where we had about 40% uh, participating uh, remotely, 60% uh, participating live. And then when we all came back to school, um, we were in uh, a fully live setting. Um, students from 13 different schools across the district, grades four through eight, the first year that we have had seventh and eighth graders uh, participating in the CPS Jazz Academy. Um, <clears throat> some highlights, which some of you in the room were actually to, um, able to see. Um, <clears throat> in January, our CPS Elementary Jazz Orchestra was selected to do a virtual uh, performance at the Global Jazz Education Network Conference. And that was a amazing experience for our students. Uh, we also uh, were able to um, work with the uh, Kennedy Heights Arts Center to do a local cable television broadcast with all of our students in the Jazz Academy, a broadcast of Music of the Harlem Renaissance. And that aired on local cable television in March, and uh, I believe we've uploaded it to CPS TV, so that will be available. Uh, we also were able to involve our very diverse faculty, and they worked with Juneteenth um, Cincinnati in February to do a performance for a virtual uh, performance for Black uh, History Month celebration. And to top it all off, yesterday, the president of the Jazz Education Global Network and an international jazz superstar spent the entire day with our 65 Jazz Academy students wow. at Kennedy Heights Art Center. He inspired, he motivated, he gave them the opportunity to see themselves being successful. And this incredible artist, he is world famous. Um, he's absolutely amazing. And it was a beautiful thing to see our students um, be able to work with him, be able to ask him questions, to be able to learn from him. So um, that's one of the wonderful things about the CBS Jazz Academy is that we're able to bring in um, these guest artists like Sean Jones and show our kids what's possible. So that was an extraordinary accomplishment. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Superintendent Mitchell uh, for her support. Uh, we outshined every other district, every other public school district in the entire state. No one else during this pandemic did anything like this. Nothing like this. <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> So the next thing that I'd like to talk about, and Superintendent Mitchell and I and um, uh, Deputy Superintendent Amat and I have been working for a couple of years to get our students involved in the local chapter NAACP Afro Cultural Technological and Scientific Olympics. This year with Director Campbell's help, we were able to focus on this. We were able to mentor, mentor our CPS students who participated in this event. We had, I think, 26 students across the district, which is, I, that must be, I mean, it's a record by probably 80% of anything we've had in the past. And for the First time we have four medal winners. Woo! Oh, um, and it was a
because three of these students I actually worked with and I mentored um, over the past six, seven weeks on the weekends. And we showed that with the right support, with the right support, our kids can do anything. And so we had four medal winners. Um, we didn't advance anyone to the national competition. You have to win a gold medal at the local to do that. But that's our goal for next year. And we will work on this. We will work on it throughout the year. We will identify CBS teachers to be mentors throughout the year. And we have a partner for the first time who is dedicated to this activity, and that is the Kennedy Heights Art Center. And it was so cool to have it there this year because everything was close to one another. The students got to meet each other. We didn't have any audiences, no audiences allowed, but the students were socially distanced. They had an opportunity to perform for a really great diverse group of judges, um, and the judges were so impressed. They commented to us afterwards how impressed they were with our CBS students, how professional they were, how courteous they were, respectful, and how talented. And that's what we need to do. And then the last thing that I'll close with, we did this with without having the funds that we usually have. Next year, those funds will be restored and we'll be able to really have some <clears throat> amazing um, extracurricular artistic activities across the district. And we're really, really looking forward to that. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, I think that was a good idea. Uh, okay. um, this is all very, very exciting. And I, I was just going to mention, how long has that jazz academy been? Right, this is the third year. This is the end of the third year. Right. I, was, I, I was a very, I was like um, one of the least talented members of the one of those high school jazz ensembles. <laughs> Uh, I keep thinking how much, uh, how much I could have learned. <laughs> uh, so it's very, very exciting to see. Thank you. Good yes, it's wonderful. It's great. Uh, and again, uh, we have great leadership in this area for sure. Appreciate the good doctor. Uh, I, I, I think your fame has uh, traveled uh, worldwide, obviously. But, but more importantly, right now for us, it's traveled to Columbus because uh, you're getting a request to perform at the Ohio School Board Association's conference. Now, 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 that may not be the biggest crowd you see, but it will also allow uh, uh, President Jones to continue to have bragging rights among the 600 and some school districts uh, in, in the state. So. We're going to hope that you'll be able, and it's a November date, and uh, you'll be getting those papers. They want that group and you to perform. So uh, it's it's very exciting. And I love the partnership with the Kennedy Heights Art Center. That's part of their neighborhood plan. And that's one of the reasons we even did Woodford's focus on the arts, was that, that in Kennedy Heights, that was part of their neighborhood master plan. And, and I just, it's, it's, I love to think, see things kind of come to full fruition. So congratulations. Well, the Thank only two you. comments or papers I have is um, I am very appreciative of this growth, even through the pandemic, for our students to be able to have exposure to these opportunities, especially like the Jazz Academy and with the world renowned um, musician. We are we to be trailblazers. Yeah. And so, as you're saying, the Northern District is doing this, so we continue to be that trailblazer. Um, and, and who knows about this um, AXO? I was scrolling Facebook and saw the presentation and heard our students' names, and I had no idea what was going on. And then I said, wait, that's what I saw on Facebook. <laughs> so I was very proud. I, was, I didn't even know what it was at first. Um, but after inquiry, I do have um, 
And I don't expect us to expect that we'll get refunded next year with our, you know, back to uh, some type of normalcy. If those students that participated in AXO this year, will they be identified as maybe ambassadors to those in their schools to expand this opportunity across the district? Is that probably I don't know how many are seniors or graduating either? Right. But I mean, how, how would that, that work? Right. I mean, that's an excellent suggestion. Um, Sullivan Kai Hill is a senior this year. Um, and I believe actually Shanta Hunter and Marcel, I think, are both juniors. So that's actually an excellent suggestion that in addition to identifying the faculty mentors mm -hmm. at the different high schools, because this is just a program for ninth through 12th grade students, that we um, engage the uh, uh, participants this year as student ambassadors. So thank you. We will definitely do that. Good. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, Athletics. Yeah. Yes. I appreciate it. Um, great to follow Dr. Rudnick and all his energy. Uh, it's, been, <laughs> <laughs> it's been great to collaborate with Dr. Rudnick. Quote Dr. Rudnick. With the right support, our kids can do anything like that. Appreciate that. Uh, so just put a little bit of information together. I will be presenting to the board as a whole on May 24th in regards to athletics and extracurriculars. Uh, but just uh, to focus on the AAA pathway, the academic and athletic accountability pathway that we started 2018-19. Uh, uh, we provided ACT boot camp support to our student athletes that have an opportunity to receive college scholarships. Those targeted students increased from 16 last year to 36 students uh, receiving the ACT prep support. 26 of them working with Larry Hodge in the Action for Athletes, and then a, a, a new partnership with Athletics and Torch Prep. Um, Larry Hodge's program was a six week program, and Torch Prep had a three week program. So, just taking the engagement that we heard from our student athletes in regards to the six week program to uh, identify a three week program as well. So happy to report, we did have a few students that um, uh, last week reported to us that uh, they had their ACT score go from a 12 to a 20 and a 17 to a 21. Yeah. 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 We're really excited about that. Um, we did see results uh, from uh, Larry Hodge and George Prep in regards to the student athletes that are fully engaged to see the increase in ACT. Uh, uh, we did a virtual SALT conference with student athlete leadership teams where we had one male and one female representing each high school. Uh, they focused on uh, resiliency and battling through adversity. As we know this year there was a um, slow start to athletics and they had the opportunity to get out there. Uh, so it was a good chance for our student athlete leaders to come together, talk about this year, and then bring those things back to their respective schools. We were able to collaborate uh, and uh, be a part of the Beyond the Tassel uh, and, and put out an athletics edition. Uh, we brought back some CPS alum that uh, were in um, uh, college playing uh, athletics and received a scholarship. They had a chance to come back and speak with some representatives from NCAA and JCAA and AIA. I'm happy to say that our team was very excited about that. We received great feedback and we look forward to uh, doing this on a quarterly basis for athletics as well going into next year. Um, Honest Game, uh, this is a pilot that we're doing. Uh, we're uh, doing that at four schools right now. It's a platform that is um, uh, support for our students, our counselors, our AAA coaches, our coaches, and our families. Um, any student athlete that's uh, participating in any sport in the district and those schools right now are able to receive uh, updates on their core classes, um, their ACT scores, and uh, the eligibility process as a whole um, in receiving college scholarships and advancing to that next level. So this is a great tool that we look to expand going into next year, uh, which would basically be an opportunity for a student to uh, log in, see what uh, uh, classes they've taken, the grades that they've received, their ACT score, and see if they're eligible uh, for a D1 scholarship, D2 scholarship, uh, it's got a sliding scale, so it uh, gives them uh, feedback and encouragement. Uh, tell some of our students some of the things that our counselors tell them. Uh, all right, well, you've got these core classes. Um, you're missing uh, this core class in English or science, whatever it may be. And it encourages those students to take that to make sure that they are 
uh, academically eligible to receive those college scholarships. Uh, so really excited about that. Just some bigger sports highlights. We did have uh, some Walnut Hills swimmers that finished top in the state, six, four, third, and a second place finisher in the state for Walnut Hills. And then as many of you know, um, I know uh, some of the board members were able to attend, but the Tap Boys basketball uh, team uh, did advance to be Division Three regional champions and advance to the state semis. So uh, give it up again one more time for Taz. And that was a huge accomplishment for the senators. Super excited to that. Um, the Innovate Grant. Um, so you may not know, but we uh, have athletic trainers supporting our schools in our district. Uh, we have a partnership with Cincinnati Children's, Mercy Health, and Tri Health to provide athletic trainers uh, for all of the athletic competition at our high schools. Uh, we were able to submit for an Innovate Grant at the start of this year uh, through the Corey Stringer Institute in Yukon. And uh, just uh, three weeks ago, we uh, were told that uh, we submitted the strongest application uh, and received $180,000 over three years to add an additional full-time athletic trainer in the district. So that was a huge big kudos to Ricky Miller, uh, who uh, worked really closely with Terry Davis um, to finalize this grant, and we're super excited. So that's going to uh, add an additional athletic trainer that will support some of our smaller schools. Macy Oteague Week. Um, many of you may have seen, we uh, did a lot of uh, video footage and hyped up Macy Oteague. He's a Walnut Hills alum that went on uh, to Baylor uh, University and was recognized as one of the uh, leaders, the top scorers in that championship game, and uh, represented our district and our city as a Division I NCAA men's basketball champion, uh, which was a, it was a huge deal, and we made it a huge deal. And we recognized him um, at a city council meeting uh, where we had Maceo T Day, as well as uh, he ended the week and wrapped up the week by throwing out the first pitch at the Red Team. So that was super awesome. Um, Speak Up and Speak Out has been a great initiative this year. It's been an honor of, of mine to have uh, worked with the students um, in that program and helped lead them uh, throughout the time, uh, more than lead me. That's how it seemed. Every time I was meeting with them, they had strong voices and, and they got the job done. One of their demands was uh, a life skills course. Uh, so we've been collaborating with Emily Campbell and her team on an initiative that some of our staff members have been working on. So really excited to continue the collaboration with the curriculum department. Uh, as we uh, build out this program. Just a couple other special events and highlights on the athletic side of things. Uh, we will have new athletic websites uh, that will uh, highlight and promote our students with videos and pictures, um, and uh, we're excited to kick that off. Uh, Hometown Ticketing is a ticketing software uh, that will allow for um, cashless uh, admission, uh, so the ability to have all pre-sales uh, eliminate uh, the utilization of cash uh, at our events. Um, we hosted a city championship in, in the fall uh, that was very successful. Um, our baseball and softball teams got to participate in the Jackie Robinson weekend, and we continue to uh, honor and recognize Gabby Rodriguez, our student athlete who passed um, uh, at Western Hills. Um, and we continue to honor and recognize Chris Nelms through the baseball softball all-star game that will be occurring next Sunday. Um, our CPS Athletics Hall of Fame, as we um, paused uh, due to COVID, uh, we will ramp that back up and get that back on the calendar for next April, having our next uh, CPS uh, Athletics Hall of Fame banquet. Our Athlete of the Month program uh, continued this year. Uh, we honor student athletes in the fall, winter, and spring for their efforts uh, in the classroom, on the respective field of play, and in the community. Um, and uh, we'll be excited to present to uh, you guys. Uh, those student athletes at the May 24th meeting, and any student athlete who's uh, recognized as an Athlete of the Month winner uh, is eligible for the Dave Durker Scholarship. Dave Durker was my predecessor and was in my role for 18 years. I don't know how, 18 <laughs> years, but, uh, but he was, and so uh, we are honoring him uh, by keeping his name alive through the scholarship. So we'll have our CPS Athletics Golf Outing on August 8th, we expect all board members to be in attendance with their foursomes ready to go. Uh, and that event does benefit the day Fairfax College. Um, that's what I have for athletics.
Uh, just a very great presentation. Uh, I have a question. Do you anticipate any uh, athletic director? Do you, do you, Josh? Do you anticipate any um, expansion of the athletic program next year? Uh, when you say the expansion of the athletic program, um, you mean more sports at the respective schools, or what are you? Yeah, talking? that. Uh, yes, that, or district wide, or something beyond athletics that still would be kind of under your auspices. Um, in regards to athletics and opportunities, there, there's sports that we've identified as sports that are at uh, some of our schools and not all of our schools. Um, soccer, uh, tennis. Uh, swimming, uh, where we've um, uh, identified the opportunity to ramp up those sports in the elementary schools through our newly added elementary athletics coordinator so that we can see future growth and impact, as well as uh, through our partnership with activities beyond the classroom. So we do plan to do that. Um, there's a lot of initiatives that we'll be pushing out as well that I plan to present to the board May 24th, but one of them being a team initiative, uh, uh, which will be a uh, focus on parent engagement and support through booster-like programs at each of our respective schools. Um, but I think that answers your question. It does, and that last thing that you mentioned about boosters, uh, that can really be a part of our expansion of PTAs as well. Great. I just wanted to say um, <clears throat> that in a year that's been like this one, one thing I've appreciated about you, Josh, is it's felt like um, approaching big challenges with a sense of optimism, that there ought to be some way to figure out a way to make this live for you for kids. Uh, and I don't think that's easy, and I don't uh, think, I'll just speak for myself, I don't take it for granted. Uh, I want to say thank you um, for sure. Yes. Our kids and their families in the district um, are better off for being able to have athletics as one part of something that felt a little bit more normal. Um, so I think in any year, these would be really exciting. I think in this year in particular, uh, they're uh, just a huge act of service. Uh, and so I'm say thank, you. thank you. For me, Josh, I, I'm just excited about all of this. I wish I could have went to more basketball games, but I know I wasn't allowed to attend. I'm going to take it to go tap. I'm Uh, I'm excited about all this. very impressed with the improvement of the impact um, prep course to see the increase in ACT to help you go above and beyond that 24 even for uh, full scholarships. Yes, uh, but um, this, is, this is very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on. These are follow up topics. I think uh, Chuck, the next two points were brought up on our. Um, Board meeting, um, and I believe Mr. Lynn, you had a couple of questions or uh, follow up uh, regarding the common army first, and then afterwards, if you want to perform clarity on the couple of things. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, Pam. I think um, the, the memo that came out from Emily and her team was very helpful. Um, I think we just had a couple of um, questions. I don't know, I'm trying to pull it up here, so I think. Um, Okay. So, um, and I think before jumping straight into the question, I think with what what's behind um, what's behind that question is just this feels like a great opportunity to try to do something with, with all the financial resources we have and with the years we've been out. Um, and I wanted to understand. We talked a little bit about this last time in terms of like, who are the students we go to get. Um, and then are we getting them there? Or are there other kids who are coming in? You know? um, and I think um, that that made me want to ask some questions about the spreadsheet that was attached. Um, it might be, you know, all, it's entirely possible that all of you is here. I just want to make sure I spot all of correctly. Um, so oh, there's, um, there's a column that says recommended. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that means? Say more about that. So, um, we opened summer scholars up to any um, but there were um, certain groups of students that we 
recommended and had conversations with families or we sent letters home or um, we did some other personal um, like connection with them that, hey, you should come to come and get this extra four weeks of instruction. And, um, and so we wanted to flag that somehow um, so that we could do what you're asking and saying, okay, of those recommendations, then how yeah. much actually do you cost? So the next column is to confirm, and they're the ones who have actually enrolled in um, college. And so that's this is this is great. And so I, I think I have um, one question about the recommended and one about the. I know we talked last time a little bit about the student IDs, uh, students who are learning, learning with English. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that those are definitely in the recommended, um, but it sounds like there might be some others. And is that just based on like judgment of school leader, like or, or a teacher? Yes. Okay. Um, so I think that's great. Just to, to pause there for a second, because I think I think it's that's that's. Um, this is really exciting that we're proactively going after specific kids. And then on the next one, um, actually, the moment, it, I couldn't quite tell if that was of the recommended or just took it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's not delineated like that in that spreadsheet. And it, it, I don't even know that it needs to be. I think, uh, I think the, the bigger picture question I was trying to ask is do we feel good? Not good, sort of good about like which kids are currently enrolling, um, and, and what's and you just say more about why we feel that way. Yeah, I think um, and Chrissy Reeves is here too. She's in the Department of Student Services, um, and I think we feel really good about. Uh, I do. I can I can speak to um, students with disabilities in it. I know our original projections that we began looking at. Actually, back in December and into January, we, we had hoped, looking at the data, that we would get about 3,500 students with disabilities, and not quite that many. We didn't have an accurate projection of that. But um, we actually have, as of today, I pulled the data because we're working on trips. We actually have 3,482 students with disabilities who have said that they will come in June. So we were um, extremely close to what we projected, and that equals um, about 53 percent of our total population of students with disability that are that are in CPS buildings, not including ones who are in separate wow. facilities. Um, so for English learners, we're still working on those exact numbers because they're a little bit more embedded into the summer scholars work and it's harder to pull them out. But what I can say is the English learners that we specifically targeted, the ones who are in slight classrooms, the newcomers that we have a specific program for, we do have, um, well, I want to make sure I have the right number. I think 12 classrooms specifically devoted to focusing on newcomers, and they are very nearly full at this point, and they're still reaching out to families to get more. So the, the students that we've targeted, we've been very successful at getting them registered. So if you, um, if you had to take a, I, I, I'm, Totally in touch with the fact that it's maybe some guessing, uh, but just your most strategic guess possible of, of the total ones that were in the recommendation. About how many do you think would be for students with disabilities? No, to like the whole recommended group. Oh, um, so we targeted um, students with disabilities, English language learners, and then our high school students in need of. Um, Credit recovery. Um, I think our the, our percentages of students with disabilities and EL learners are going to be higher um, than possibly our high school um, students who are enrolled. It's difficult to give. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the precision is not what's important to me. Just to, just speaking for myself, it's just uh, a couple things seem true. One. Um, High stakes, you know, like uh, kids who were weren't able to uh, engage um, in virtual learning in the way we'd like them to, or maybe attendance was low, or uh, working to graduate from credit recovery. But um, I just think that the, it feels like a really important thing to work on. The other thing that feels true is we have money. Uh, like there's, there's, if, if, if I'm remembering Jen's numbers right, it's like three hundred million dollars we have to spend. And so I, I, I keep asking myself if we're, if we're in a situation where we really want to do good with kids this summer and we're sh short on the number of ones we want to get there, 
when you use some of these resources. Um, and then I, I don't know what the best way is. You, you all want to have a better sense of how to do that. I would. But I'm just going to roll the money on the table. Yeah. Um, I, I can say that we're excited about the number of kids who have, like, when we first started doing this, our families are tired, kids are tired, our staff is tired. Um, Principal, like just in talking with principals, they were like, we're, we have an early goal of being about 30% of our students. And, um, you know, just like Christy pulled the numbers this morning, we pulled the overall number again this morning and have gone up to 10,505 kids who have confirmed. Um, and so I can say that we feel really good about the recruitment and marketing. Um, that has happened, and the kids who have said yes yeah, as well. And I mean, the fact that they're going to get enrichment too, they're they're excited. Good. Good. Well, I, I appreciate the follow up. I think uh, uh, I just want to see us do everything we can to leverage the summer. And I think a big part of that means making sure it goes to kids. Um, and not, it's not, I don't care about all kids. I think some kids have had more impact with this last year than others. Um, it can be a strategic. Well, yes, thank you. I'd like, I'd like to uh, second uh, the, the report regarding the recruitment of the special needs kids. I've had at least three teachers just when I've seen them, and it's really at all different levels, high school and uh, an elementary and even a middle school, uh, you know, middle grades teacher has been extremely impressed with the recruitment of their students that are uh, in, in need of, of special support. I think, and, and that's, a, that's a tough crowd for families and, and what have you too. It's, a, it's, a, it's been pretty impressive, at least from the teacher's perspective, I think. And I've heard that from people that don't necessarily always think we're doing a wonderful job. They, they know they are, but they're not too sure we are. So uh, I want to compliment. I still am concerned about seeing the list, and maybe I've missed it, of which of the, not which, but uh, at which schools, which teachers are going to be serving. I just still need, maybe, I, again, maybe I missed it, but I need a list of, of uh, staff by schools just to see it, but also I have a question for anyone that can answer it. If we have too many kids at one place and not enough, I know we're consolidating when we have to. Does that mean we are in a position to move staff as needed? Yeah, um, in collaboration with talent, um, we're working very closely to look at those teacher-student ratios um, so that we can redistribute um, if, if, for some reason, students um, come or don't come um, to summer scholars. We will get you that um, staff full lift. We're, like I said, we're in collaboration with talent and hopefully can add it to our memo on the 15th. Okay, thank you. So, Board Member Bolton, are you asking for the specific teacher names by school? No, I, I, we, we approved all, all those names, uh, but uh, when we, in the uh, uh, your report or treasurer's report back at the last board meeting or one before that, I don't need to know the specific names of teachers. I need to maybe know or understand the numbers. I think that would be I think that would be helpful. I have no interest in the names, but the numbers would help me understand maybe the culture of the buildings. Uh, would make me uh, see how it's doing high school versus middle grade, that kind of stuff. Okay. It's it. it's more of a yeah, it's more of a the gross look at it instead of anything specific or personnel. Thank you. And I just have one inquiry, and this assistant superintendent Black to get through. And it's probably not in this group, but probably have the safety. Mm -hmm. But there is conversation and concern about uh, supports from nurses during summer school and protocol going on among schools, mm -hmm. especially with my own staff, <laughs> regarding you know making sure that still follow this follow follow through. And I don't know how the information is getting to them or how that's being worked out, but that is a concern. Apparently, the health centers person is saying they're not responsible with the school nurse and they don't know how that works and they want to make sure that teachers or administrators are not left with the value support or ongoing 
Total call. Yeah. So I'll look into that. Our nurses are going to be on site this time. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. That's great. But, um, all right, next one is about Matt, Mr. Lee. Paper was about Matt's schools. Yeah, we, we got this great memo, and I just wanted to hear someone talk about what they, what sense they were making out of it, what they want to do, what I felt about it. Yeah, um, so just some contextual pieces about the Matt data. Uh, this was from our most recent um, administration of the Matt winter term. Uh, so that was a stretch of December to February was that window. Uh, it's important to know, uh, obviously, that we were in uh, a couple different instructional models during that time. Started out remote instruction, and then the second half of that window uh, was blended uh, learning. Uh, so uh, this window was a combination of remote assessments and in-person assessments. Um, the memo also uh, displays both achievement within that term for winter, and then uh, comparison of growth, specifically to the year back for winter 2020, which was the last fully in-person of, of that pre-pandemic. Um, uh, we looked again at the validity, validity data uh, because of the number of remote assessments that we gave during this time. Uh, MAP recommends looking at the standard error measure as a gauge of validity. Uh, the data looks good uh, still with those remote assessments, but we do know that there's an increased, uh, increased examples and feedback from the field around the difficulties of administering these assessments remotely. Typically, you have all the kids in the same room. You can control that environment if they're supportive. We know from talking with educators that there was a wide range of testing environments that were uh, experienced during these remote assessments. Kids that are at daycare centers testing the room with you know five kids in that room uh, versus the kid that was in their bedroom. Um, and it was also difficult to, as much as we communicated and, and uh, put this message out, to keep you know the grandmother from coming over and helping out of the first grade student on the um, So with that in mind, uh, we put um, a very important statement in there uh, that we should use caution at a district level when we're looking at this data. Uh, I think this data is, is best in the hands of a classroom teacher uh, right now because they know the specific testing environment of each of their students. Um, uh, the data around uh, the impact of the pandemic is a growing uh, data set. I mean, we're continuing to learn more and more from this data. Um, important notes from this data, uh, we did see a decline in participation, uh, both from previous winter and from the fall slightly, uh, from this past fall. Uh, we were around set in the 70% range, which being uh, both reading and math in terms of the percentage of students assessed. Uh, that appears to track with national data uh, from NWEA across the country uh, that about a quarter of students nationally are missing when compared to last academic school year. Um, in this data, we did observe a decline in that typical achievement and growth when compared uh, to the data from the last fully in-person administration map. So again, you know, what we caution uh, around every data point, even outside of a pandemic, is this is one data point that needs to be qualified with all other data points, state assessment data, DIPLS data. Uh, so this, this picture of this year will continue to grow. Uh, we're right in the middle of state testing right now. We should get those results in the future. Okay, question. Yes. So, um, so, so what's the thing you want to do? Okay, you know, is there anything that uh, it makes you all think we should prioritize or do differently? I, I think from from our office's lens, it, you know, it's it's because of the challenges of the remote assessment. These data points really need to be qualified with the, the uh, data that teachers are getting from the curriculum based assessments, DIPLS data if you're a, a K through reading teacher, uh, I ready data if you're a math teacher. It's part of a larger picture uh, about uh, where our students are. But, you know, I, I think 
Uh, there is some evidence that there has been an impact on achievement and growth last year. I, I really appreciated the report. I think, um, you know, for, for my part, I, I continue to think that uh, all of our educators and all the families in CPS have just had this enormous achievement. The point they've had several different learning model experiences, none of which were perfect, all of which everybody was trying really hard to do right. Um, but I think it was challenging. I think you had, you know, for my uh, dad at the kindergarten, they're watching from learn on an iPad as an experience. Uh, you know, everybody I think is doing the best they can. But you have, you know, parents who are trying to work at the same time, kids who have additional siblings in the house, all of the economic turbulence of this last year. Like, I, I just think it's been a very, very I just think that one of the things I took away from the memo was I do think we are starting to see evidence of a toll that that hardly has had. Uh, and when I was looking at the numbers, I mean, it, it, it's, I think this is still true, even if to your point, Justin, it's true in lots of schools, that the fact that we're missing uh, information on one in four kids is a lot. You know? like, like, it makes me, it, it's, so to say that the, the scores are down and we're missing scores for a quarter of kids. And my hypothesis has to be that the kids were missing, those aren't the ones who pulled scores up. You know, but those would be some of the kids experiencing even more challenges. You know, and maybe I'm wrong about that. In the winter data, that's actually, a, I'm, the largest groups within the missing data, on hills. And I could be wrong about that point, and, and hopefully I am. Uh, I think that, you know, when I look at some of the headline of it, you know, if I saw this, it was, I think, 17% of kids were at the 55th percentile or above. 17% uh, of kids are very low. Really low. And even, even if that's wrong, when you go back to the winter 2020, it was only 23% then. You know? That's still really low. You know? And, and, and I believe our kids can do it, and I believe our teachers can do it. I'm just trying to figure out how do we seize this opportunity, particularly with these federal funds we have, uh, to try to do something bold. Um, and and so this is this is uh, you know one of the I've been trying to read up on what is there research out there are there things people are trying you know what could make a difference and you know, it's not like the, the the fanciest bells and whistles thing on the planet but the thing I keep reading about is this idea of uh, high dosage tutoring or H HDT which which as I understand it is is tutoring when kids get at least seventy five minutes a week for thirty six weeks straight. Uh, that's a lot to right? <laughs> um, but the, the research on that seems to be that it's one of the most powerful things out there. Um, and it does seem to me to be a, a, a wonderful potential use of some federal money um, because it doesn't create long-term funding. You know, you wrap up a program with some tutors for the next 18 months or two years, and then it sunsets. You know, and so it's something that absolutely use federal money for. The research is there. I just think we have lots of evidence from our district that we, we need to try something bold. Um, and so I think my um, my request was going to be, you know, I know we've already started working on the budget. There have been many, many conversations about the budget already. All that is true. And this also feels like it's really important. So, so what I wanted to ask was, can, can somebody look into that? You know, and either maybe it's already being done, or maybe uh, there's a really good reason why we can't do it. Um, or maybe it's a great idea. We should try this together. Um, but, but as we go through the next couple of weeks, um, it, this feels like an important thing to have a plan for. And uh, I wanted to offer that. So I would say that it's definitely something we could look into. Um, our quality improvement work tells us not to start directly with intervention. That many times, organizations, businesses, school districts will have a problem, and what they immediately start to do is to throw intervention at a problem without knowing what's working and what's not working. And so um, I think to really look at what the goals are and then identify what are the drivers, what are the conditions that have to be in place for our students to excel. Maybe tutoring is it, maybe tutoring isn't it. And it's an intervention that we could then identify. But I would caution against throwing large amounts of money into something that we don't know for sure will be successful. All the improvements is you would do small tests of change and you would try something before you would do it. But definitely something to look at. And I would just like to add, we do have a plan. So maybe on the next agenda, sharing our KDDs and our work and um, 
literacy and math specifically. Um, so we do recognize even before the pandemic, we had to increase achievement. So there's work um, that we have done. We have done a root cause analysis. We have done Pareto charts to see where is the greatest impact. Um, so we do have a plan. So I would love to bring the curriculum department back and share that plan, whether it's our managers who are leading that plan and the work we have done on with Unbound Education on accelerating learning. Um, to board member uh, Bolton's point around moving past remediation um, and doing something to strengthen our core and acceleration and making sure our kids have access to grade level content. So that has been truly our focus is based on research. Um, and I think we just need to do a better job of communicating that here so you're you're fully aware. So um, Ms. Bowers, whatever you, you want us to come at. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to be a contrarian about this, I think. Um, I, I frankly don't think that there's a lot of direction the district on hold can take from the map results. I, I was gratified to hear Justin say that the real value of any of this might be at the classroom level because the teachers who are with those kids, they know their individual situation. Normally you can draw many conclusions from such an important test as map, and it has, it has district-wide um, value. In this case, I, I don't, it doesn't have a lot of credibility because of the conditions of the testing. Um, and I, I would have rather we'd spent more time on the instruction than the testing, but we've got it and it will be useful for teachers. And, and to Ben's point, there's things we can do, but um, I, this, this is in the hands of the teachers at this point in time. And whatever the district does, it might slightly inform, but not greatly inform, in my opinion. I'm going to have it on the agenda on the forward to hearing about the accelerated learning mm -hmm. part so that that can be a better clarity. In addition to when we start school back in the fall, those fall scores can help uh, us also uh, guide us. And we're doing some small test of change right now um, at all of our high schools for our seniors. So they have extended learning opportunities. Um, so we're not even waiting for the oh. summer. We're collecting the data right now learning from it and we're going to adopt measures for the fall and scale it up or we may abandon or adjust some of the, the measures so um that's that's currently in place and dr dean blaze is, is leading that work so is that inclusive so are we using this current testing as a baseline also that we're doing to finish it up or we're also when you say uh current testing which test the, i don't know so maybe it's state testing it's state yeah. testing right yes. right now. So that will come in in the summer. Okay. So and that's how we're yeah. planning for mm -hmm. something, right? Okay. Anything else, Mr. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking about the, the um, really helpful response from the superintendent. I think, I think what I'm trying to communicate is I'm open to any number of different plans. It doesn't have to be two, right? Mm -hmm. But I do, I do think, from my perspective, trying to figure out which kids have suffered the most learning loss because of the flash and putting our best possible plan forward for those kids is job one. Uh, and I just want our plan to be really good. And I, I think talking about it next time sounds great. I think some of the questions I'd like to ask are things like, um, there is some significant research behind Ideas are sharing. Um, what's our level of confidence that we're doing something different? That we know it's going to have a better result than something. Uh, and I'm, I'm open to being persuaded that, that we should, it, it's the wrong call, you know, because I think having that discussion, looking at the evidence on it, um, and then lining up the strategy there is something that's uh, speaking for myself as well. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Bell. Yeah, just and, and I, how shall I say this? Um, a lot of that is 
professional <laughs> development. I think as a person that taught a long time, you fall into doing the same thing over and over, regardless of what the district tells you to do, or regardless of what initiative is out there. And maybe too often, the folks in the front line kind of still are doing what they used to do, even though they're great teachers. And it may have worked before, but, I, but to Pam's point, about accelerating and about having um, more rigor. I think there are grade levels in our district that aren't thinking that yet. And I think that has to be the biggest, one of the number two or three PD efforts that we make is to expand our teachers, in particularly in some grades, vision of how, how, how smart our children are. Um, any other comments? Um, other business. Uh, there was a uh, action item on um, the from the last section regarding the superintendent evaluation timeline, and I'm asking to get the table there. Um, is there any agreement to table that to kind of look at that even more in depth and uh, more in detail at the uh, next meeting or, or so forth? Uh, I'm having a little understanding you. There was an action item from last um, SAC meeting, uh, and it was the superintendent evaluation timeline. I'm asking the committee if you can table that for next month or, or what have you, so we can look more depth into it. Yeah, I I, I would imagine we can ta table that, or I mean, unless we want to talk about it. I think there was good discussion. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it. Yes, it was. I just think that we need to look more in depth and, and timing wise. That that was something I would push to the next next meeting. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that would be good. If you okay. go to executive. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, and one of the things I have two more things. One is concurrent learning. In our um, board meeting, we, we had a presentation. No, it was committee of the whole meeting. I believe we talked about concurrent learning to presentation. And I believe in this meeting, we want to talk more about what we thought uh, about concurrent learning for next school year. Does anybody have any comments about that? No? Mr. Lindsay? Thank you. Sir, I, I, I have been, I think, a, a loud advocate for doing this six months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even as recently as two and a half or three months ago. I do think um, seeing what it's been like having kids back five years mm -hmm. and um, seeing younger and younger kids getting vaccinated and seeing the price tag and seeing decisions other school districts are making around us. I don't want to spend $43 million on something that I don't think we need. Uh, but that's my perspective. I'm very open to people telling me I'm wrong about that. Um, but that's my perspective. I think we should spend that $43 million on something. That was a very compelling presentation uh, Jeremy presented to us at the Committee of the Hall. So I, I, I'm, um, and more, I'm more compelled to align with you. A few months ago, yes, I was very adamant about this, um, just looking at the circumstances where we've been. But I think we've progressed. Um, Board Member Bolton? Uh, yes. Um, I think what we should do is proceed with concurrent uh, instruction, but only uh, building by building, meaning that I would love if every one of our buildings at least had the facility and the capacity to do it, not by classroom by classroom, but instead by the facility itself so that teachers and others could book it, um, could book in there if they had something particular that they wanted to share more widely or make available or if they, we reach out globally, uh, or there's a demonstration teacher that has something that they could demonstrate. So I, I'm not interested um, in every classroom having it. I think it's, it would be difficult, but I do think we should take the opportunity, since we have money, maybe, to do some aspect of it so that we had the capacity to use it. And a thousand years ago when I taught, we had even at uh, Little Wyoming High School, we'd have a lecture. We had a lecture room, 
in the high school and we did lectures versus small group discussion. And of course, we were on mods and that was crazy. But to me, it would be really a great thing to use whatever money we have to do to expand the capacity of each building uh, to be able to do something that would be uh, valuable like that. But not every classroom, every teacher, every subject, every grade, no. So it sounds like that we that we're kind of really saying the same thing. Are you going to agree? I, I like what you said, Ms. Fulton, um, about having it as a as a, a resource or option in the building. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any feedback regarding um, families who decide they don't want to come back five days? Um, it, your viewpoint about that. Not interrupting you. Go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I have two thoughts on this. One was, I think that for you, for your suggestion, it's hard for me to know whether I love it or not, having that different without the numbers, how much it's going to cost. I might be great, but I would be like, I think that there could, I've just learned there's so much here I don't know. Uh, so before I say something too strongly, I do, would want to check the numbers. And the other thing is, I think from, from, from my perspective, uh, I, I shared my piece already. I just know that I can't some other colleagues see their strong feelings about this mm -hmm. on this committee. Um, so what was the process to get there? Well, this would be part of the minutes, and, and if we're all in agreement, um, we need more numbers, but this is like the discussion that will be presented in our minutes at the board meeting. Probably not Monday, but the next board meeting after that. Um, and then we can probably get feedback from them then uh, about what they think. Committee, uh, yeah, it will be important for uh, the development of the budget to know as early as possible. And as the superintendent has mentioned, uh, if we were to do it classroom by classroom, we'd need to be starting the, the purchasing it now, basically. So it is time sensitive. But I, you know, I would also suggest that if we really do have families, even if it's 10% or 15%, Obviously, we have to develop CDA in a way that is more expansive than it was even this past year. But it's possible you might have to have a cadre of teachers virtually in every build. Well, I didn't mean that as a pun, but virtually in every building that could be offering some sort of remote capacity at the home school, so to speak. But you, and I don't know how that works. I don't know if that's supplemental. I don't know. I think that's could be some further discussion where there's some kind of cadre, not every grade or every subject, but somehow um, determining uh, having that group of teachers that could do that from the home school. Right. And maybe it's only, you know, core curricular with people that have multiple grade level. Who knows? Right. But the intent is to have that ready for all. Well, I have a question. I know, I'm, I'm thinking. I, yeah, you're right. That's, like, this is like a perfect example like, why we do small test of change, and you don't just like, or you do small, a group of times, and not just like go whole hog. Imagine if we would have a couple of months ago spent $43 million on something that now we don't even think we should spend that kind of money on. So, mm -hmm. um, Think big, start small, and then scale things. So we follow the same concept if, if um, thinking of what committee member Butler just mentioned about the option at the home school four classes. I know Jeremy presented the every school like the first semester, but could we still have that same concept um, with just one teacher option at the school? I think it's something to, to definitely look into. Um, just keep in mind. And I don't think like it's a barrier, but keep in mind that the technology infrastructure and the devices themselves is only one component. Right. The other really big component yeah. is the teacher yeah. having the ability and um, the ability is not probably the right word. The, the, cap the capacity to do this. And so, I mean, maybe to board member Bolton um, thought, and we've talked about a lot of this at PLT, especially at the elementary school, maybe you have. If there's a need in terms of the numbers, mm -hmm. a classroom per grade level that is your, you know, your your current learning classroom, 
but those kids would then have to follow up like um, in a cohort. Oh, okay. So if you have five kindergarten teachers, all of them are going to be doing Right. Maybe one or two. And, and I know that Tiani's group, they looked at a lot of different models. We're seeing like it's challenging though is that the high school level with all the different courses that kids are taking. So and then the other cost. So Jeremy gave you the cost of the technology, but if you are identifying just that 10% of kids, then is it um, more staffing expense? Because it's not the same oh, right. teacher, right. you, you know. Yeah. So it's the staffing expense um, was quite high when we were looking at. So something that the team will definitely look at and come with a different options to consider. Okay. Well, we do need to move on to soon because as I told you yesterday, there's some kind of worldwide limited number of these chips. Some kind of chip that Jeremy said if I need it. Good conversation. Thank you for, for moving that forward to give us a little bit more direction. All right. The only other thing I had on others, I wanted to follow up, and I'm not really sure who I should follow up with this uh, about, but um, as, as I mentioned in the board meeting, I visited Central State University, um, and I was able to speak to the principal. Well, we had presentations a couple of districts. This I represent a club that there was um, uh, Norwood. Princeton and North Ohio Shields through the Ohio School Board Association Black Caucus. Uh, Al Long was the chair of that of that group. So nevertheless, there was such good information on their agriculture program, agribusiness, uh, water management, uh, sustainability agriculture, and then there was a wonderful presentation. The next board meeting after I went about Great things going on at Aiken with agribusiness and then uh, the board that he wanted him on. So I thought that this would be a great connection for somebody to look into this, to see if we could uh, maybe have a discussion with them about how that would benefit some of our students. Lots of money there that they need to give away from the state, like that might be in a land grant college uh, in agriculture. Um, it could be helpful for smaller schools for some of our students. Um, just a wonderful opportunity. All right, any other business, Ms. Bolton? Yes, just as a follow-up uh, regarding the budget, uh, I think in the treasurer's uh, oral report uh, at the last board meeting, uh, she suggested uh, that out of the various board committees, uh, any uh, further discussion about specific issues for the budget, uh, maybe when we have today, but more particularly we have a, the, the first Friday in June uh, as we talk about this coming agenda. Uh, I'd like us to talk about a little bit more from the administration about CDA and what they're envisioning about CDA. Also a, a little bit more about what they're talking about in terms of the outside, GPS outside and also the success centers and the career uh, specialists at the high school. Because those are all apparently budget issues and I, I think it'd be great for us to have a discussion and a presentation or more discussion than presentation on those topics, Madam Chair. Can you reiterate your ask, Ms. Bolton? I, I got the yeah. point of your ask. I'd like to have a committee discussion with the administration about CDA and what they're thinking about the success centers and specifically whether that's going to include mind print and then the career uh, career specialists at the high schools and the outdoor piece how they're looking at that because we're, uh, they, they seem to be on the list on the budget, but it'd be great. For, I think our, our colleagues will be asking us what we think about it, and I'd like us to have a discussion about it in June. For the June meeting? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. 
But that will be agenda. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Just one piece. Yeah, um, I don't know if this is like a quick conversation we should have now. We could have now, or can we put on the uh, agenda? I don't think. But um, I really enjoyed our conversation last time about the curriculum uh, and about uh, all of our math and ELA and science being accumulated in the reports about how that news. Um, not news, I guess. I was just sort of learning about it. So, um, I think. One thing I also wanted to learn more about at some point was how we help teachers learn how to use new curriculum when we get it. Um, and I, I, I keep thinking about this federal money that's on the lines the third time I brought that the, um, there are um, There are all kinds of organizations for <coughs> teachers on uh, curriculum. Uh, and that, that could be an interesting reason. Um, and so I, 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 it, it might be that that's all totally covered. You don't feel like you need any help. Or it could be a way to use some of the money we have. Um, but I wanted to just learn a little bit more about what's already happening and then to what extent you know, could um, that be an important way for us to get uh, increasing leverage from this federal investment. We, we can share our PD plan for uh, next year. Um, I do want to say for the beginning of the year, um, especially in August, we're doing a lot of work on social and emotional learning and trauma. Yeah. And that has been the request of, of staff members um, specifically. And so we have a plan so we can share the yeah. uh, PD plan. Um, and just the other thing to consider as well um, is the time of pulling teachers. So we use our district PD days, uh -huh. and then Ms. Campbell is working on um, using some federal funds for after hours on what we can do uh, with teachers for curriculum development and, and planning. So we can bring that forward as well. That, that sounds great. I think the focus on, on social emotional learning is mm -hmm. great sense. And mm -hmm. I think the, um, can we, when we train teachers on curricula, do we do that in the house? Do we contract out for it? We've done both. Do so if it's, um, a particular curriculum, whether it's our written wisdom, uh -huh. is a partner, yeah, right? And it usually comes with the curriculum material when we do our, um, when we're purchasing the material. Okay. We have done work with the Gates Foundation with math uh -huh. last year and had experts come in. I can't remember the, the group's name. We use Unbound Ed. Uh -huh. And We'll also um, talk about how we are supporting teachers in our presentation to accelerate learning in our community. And also, I think it's important, Emily, to also put um, the social justice, the uh, representation of um, students of color in our curriculum. So we'll give the, the, the full picture. Thank you. Questions or comments from the Zoom? Okay. Wish the best at our meeting adjourned. Enjoy your week and happy morning. Thank you.